People always ask us about the success of our coral restoration projects here in the Florida Keys. So Amelia Mora, our science program manager, is here to lead a panel with Matthew Ware, Les Kaufman, William Pratt, Scott Winters, and Stephen Miller. Together, they will be discussing a recent scientific article titled Survivorship and Growth in Staghorn Coral Outplanting Projects in the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. Hi everyone, thank you for tuning into Coral Palooza Digital 2020. Um, I'm excited to host a special interview session with the writers of a new paper published in the Open Access Journal PLOS One um, titled Survivorship and Growth in Staghorn Coral, a Cropper Cervicornis Outplanting Projects in the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. Um, this recent paper has made a big splash in the restoration community as the first comprehensive large-scale analysis of the survival of artificially propagated staghorn coral genotypes um, placed out onto the reefs in, in South Florida. So before we get started, my name is Amelia Mora. I am the science program manager at Coral Restoration Foundation. And the authors we have with us today are Matt Beware, researcher at Florida State University, Les Kaufman, professor at Boston University, William Precht, director at Marine and Coastal Programs for Dial Cordian Associates, Scott Winters from Coral Restoration Foundation, um, Stephen Miller, senior research scientist at Nova Southeastern University, and a board member at CRF. I'm really excited to have you all with me today to discuss this um, and really break down this article and get into the implications for the field of coral restoration. Um, so let's get started. So really to kick things off, Matt, as the lead author on this paper, could you give us um, a pretty broad overview of the goals and the major findings of the study? Absolutely. So the use of nursery raised corals in reef restoration projects is relatively new and nurseries are starting to turn out large enough volumes um, that we can now start conducting large scale projects. So the idea with this study was kind of to evaluate the growth, survival, and condition of nursery raised corals, which have been out on the reef for several years at this point. Um, so in order to get a sense of how long these corals are surviving, how well they're growing, um, and really to kind of figure out what works and, and what doesn't work. Um, so in a nutshell, uh, the study had found that most of the monitor outplants did well for about the first year or so, but then tapered off after roughly two years. Um, colonies tended to stay small, averaging in the ballpark of about 50 centimeters in diameter. Um, and given these growth and survival outcomes and without significant improvements um, to the present mortality, uh, we were estimating that it would take decades to centuries to meet some of the NOAA recovery guidelines, the NOAA recovery targets, excuse me. Um, however, there were a subset of corals which survived for most, if not all, of the study period and grew larger than a meter in diameter. So there is potential for these corals to do very well. So um, now the trick will be figuring out why these corals did better, um, under what conditions they did better, and how we can you know, um, use that knowledge going forward. And I know that um, one of the first things that I know a lot of has been getting a lot of attention um, in the restoration community is the upfront, what looks like really upfront, low survivorship numbers. Um, should we be surprised to see that long-term, low long-term survivorship? You know, these corals have been facing a lot of stressors um, for decades now. So to see that long low, that long-term survivorship be so low, um, it's a little depressing, it's frustrating. Um, I'm not sure I'd call it surprising, uh, but Again, there were these subset of corals that did very well. So even under these current stressors, there is um, some things we can learn about those better performing corals. So hopefully, you know, as we start looking at more modern projects at these larger scales, um, that we can take some of those lessons learned and, and improve that survivorship going forward. This paper really is kind of that first comprehensive look, that look from 30,000 feet. Um, and it's a lot of the early effort. So, uh, it really points to the importance of this information going forward. And this is, again, just that first step. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I totally agree that we still have a lot to learn um, in the field of restoration. Um, and this doesn't have to be for Matt specifically, but from doing this research and from you know, studying these colonies so closely over you know, this many years, since 20, 2007 when they were outplanted, um, what insights do you have into perhaps some of the factors that have contributed to the lower survivorship projection, projections um, and to maybe the higher ones as well. Yeah. So 
Um, the way that the monitoring was conducted, unfortunately, we can't necessarily peg a one-to-one -one cause and effect relationship that says, you know, this particular colony died from disease or this one from bleaching or from storms. So we really are really only looking at kind of the big picture <clears throat> here. So we did find some, you know, reef specific um, survivorship, some differences between different habitats in terms of growth and things like that. So there are some differences in space and time with some of these factors um, that really need to get kind of really drilled down into, um, unfortunately, because we can't, you know, pick up that one to one relationship right now. That's some, some things that should be going forward with new monitoring efforts really to keep track of water temperature, disease, you know, all these different stressors that, that they're under. Um, so we can get more of that cause and effect relationship. But our study does suggest that there are some differences in both space and time um, that are worth our further investigation. Absolutely. Um, I think this question, you know, could be directed to Stephen or perhaps Bill. Um, so these data are based on um, outplant projects conducted prior to 2013. Um, and, you know, they are very small sample sizes. So given the advances in techniques and scale of current restoration strategies, uh, how do we make the argument that these findings are still relevant? Stephen, let me take the first part of it, and then I think you can follow up on, on the relevance. But I look at this as a geologist. I, I come in as a geologist looking at the dynamics of a cropper of populations throughout the Florida reef track over not just the last decades, but over centuries to millennia to glacial interglacial cycles. And one of the things that we know about reefs in Florida is they're at the limit of reef building. And a recent study that was performed by the United States Geological Survey that was senior authored by Lauren Tote uh, and, and others from the USGS shows that the reefs in the Florida Keys have not been functionally accreting coral reefs for the last 3,000 years. So while we've had populations of Acropora, they've been highly ephemeral, and they haven't been really building reefs like they were previously. And this has to do with some climate factors. Uh, it has to do with uh, both warm and cold temperatures during the winter time. And as Matt said earlier, the, the way we monitor these corals, we can't look at one picture and then the next picture and definitively say why the coral may have suffered partial mortality in between. But there were a couple major events that took place between 2007 and 2013, one of which was a major cold water event in, the Janu in January of 2010, which led to wide scale coral mortality of a cropper of cervicornis along the floor. And this is very, very well documented in the literature. There also have been some tropical storms and her passages of hurricanes that have had impacts as well. So to really tease it out, uh, it's very difficult to look at a specific cause and effect relationship. But the one thing we do know is that these, thing, that these populations have been highly dynamic on long temporal scales so these results should not be that surprising to us. And so one of the things about restoration is that the word itself is really positive. So there's an expectation when we do restoration that results are going to be good. But restoration is really difficult. And we shouldn't expect that corals that we put out from nurseries are going to do any better than what's happening in the natural environment, in the wild populations. And that's pretty much what we see. Corals come and go, as Bill explained, on ecological terms every few years, maybe decadal. And I expect that we'll see the same thing with corals that we outplant to, uh, to reefs in the Keys. The difference is, however, that when we conduct restoration and when we're doing it repeatedly, we end up with sites that were previously absent of coral, now with hundreds, if not thousands, of colonies. That helps prevent local extinction, it maintains genetic diversity. Those are really positive things that we can claim as a result of the work that's been ongoing at CRF for some time, including the early projects. So I would say the glass is more than half full in terms of success of restoration projects, but there are still many challenges ahead. Amelia, may I follow up on that? Absolutely. 
Okay, so I think when uh, lay folk hear about restoration, they think it's like building a skyscraper. You, you just put it all together and assemble it, takes a while, and then you put the, uh, you know, the outside on, it looks nice, you open it. That's not, that's not how restoring a natural community works. The way you restore a natural community is you set it up to build itself. You have to make sure that all the critical pieces are there, uh, like Stephen was just mentioning, a viable population that can sustain itself, even if there aren't that many individuals. And then when conditions, as conditions improve, it'll, it'll begin to reconstruct itself much faster than we could. So it's maintaining that potential that's really critical. And restoration does accomplish that. So there's a lot of um, feedback, I think, in the restoration community about, you know, there are still so many active stressors at play, um, both here in the Florida Keys and worldwide. Um, and, you know, what, what is the rationale for continuing to, you know, throw corals out there and to put money behind these restoration programs if we're going to see low survivorship numbers? And in this uphill battle, how are we going to meet the proper recovery plan? Do, do you want me to address that or? Sure. Yeah. Um, well, I, I, first of all, this is the first uh, comprehensive review of the outcomes of staircone coral restoration in the Caribbean that I know of, and uh, uh, at least of this magnitude. And I was celebrating that any coral survived. <laughs> I mean, you have to look at it the other way. <laughs> I mean, what this means is that we can establish a population beachhead. And eventually, uh, that population can sustain itself. Now, it's not going to re-carpet the entire coral reef and start building it until ambient conditions improve. But, but that can happen if we do it. And saying that it hasn't happened yet isn't helping the situation. Yeah. Scott, do you have anything to add there? Yeah, I actually want to build on what Les said. I think um, this is an incredibly optimistic result. I mean, these are early results when we were just throwing stuff against the wall. So it wasn't even clear that any of this, um, nur any of these nursery raised corals were going to survive, given how everything was going. The fact that with this disorganized experimental kind of pilot study, we saw as much survivorship as we did is wonderfully optimistic to kind of feed the strategy on how we can now work to get higher levels and more diversification in the types of corals and the genotypes and start looking at some of the, the reasons and hopefully we can you know work on larger areas and have more corals survive and by more corals i mean we putting more and more out there you know it's not a question of putting stuff out there once and hoping it all survives. This is an active management process and it's about large scale restoration work. I'd like to add something to what Scott said also, and it has to do with CRF. And in 2012, I believe it was, so that's eight years ago now, um, CRF put together a scientific advisory panel and that included Stephen Les, myself, and a few other coral scientists. And one of the goals was to look at what we had done from the early days of CRF in terms of the outplants and to figure out what worked and what didn't. And actually, this study is an outgrowth of one of the first recommendations of that scientific committee was, well, let's look at what we've done over the last, you know, seven years or whatever it is, see what's worked, what doesn't, and... And like Scott said, in the early days, we were just throwing things against the wall to see what sticks. And what we learned is that there are some things that didn't stick and a couple things that did. And we've used those. So I would assume, and we will know this in time, but this study is only through corals, the 2013-2014. So we have six more years of outplanting of a lot more corals, more genotypes under more different environmental conditions at more reefs. So 
I would expect that as we continue to learn, our results will continue to get better. And we'll also have to understand how those results uh, come in with respect to large scale forcing functions like cold events or hurricanes. For instance, Hurricane Irma went across the Florida Reef Track in 2017. What was the impact of Hurricane Irma on outplanted populations? So these are important questions that we need to answer. But again, I, and I think I agree with everybody on the panel that the results of this are more, the half is glass, the glass is more half full than it is half empty. These are exciting results. And, and I think the survivorship that we saw is, is very exciting. And like Steven said, it, it puts corals out in places where they weren't previously because of how they had declined over the previous few decades. And now we're putting corals back to where they used to be and they're self-sustaining. Even if they're self-sustaining at small population levels, this is preventing regional extinctions. It's increasing genotypic diversity on the reefs. It's increasing structure on the reefs, which is gonna bring in other organisms like more fish, more invertebrate, invertebrates. So to me, these are really, really exciting results, not negative results. I'd like to add one thing. If you look at the paper carefully, we present the results in two different ways. One is related to some modeling that was done. And the modeling was done to help us try and sort out some of the differences among sites, uh, habitat types, and uh, when the projects were uh, outplanted to different reefs. And you can define those differences based on the slopes of the curves and um, it gets pretty technical, but it turns out that sample sizes were small. There's a lot of variation. And other than increasing rate of failure, the models don't tell us much about what was happening out there. And the results at longer periods of time are, are, are pretty negative because not a lot of corals survive. But it's based kind of on percentages. So if you start with a lot of corals, you could still end up with a lot of corals if you have thousands and thousands to begin with, you end up with hundreds of thousands at that end, and that's still significant. But we also presented results, and if you look at table one, those are actually based on colony counts. And one of the things that, that happened is, even with small numbers of colonies, if you look at a project that started at Dry Rocks early on with 18 colonies, over five years later, from those 18 colonies, we only lost two. So there is potential for even longer term survivorship. And we just don't yet know what that special set of circumstances are. Uh, all around this little cohort of, of corals at dry rocks, all sorts of stuff was going on, bleaching, disease, uh, storms. Yet in this one spot, we still had, had good results. So I'm not saying that we have to identify that special set of circumstances. I'm just saying that there still is a lot of variability, a lot that we don't know about what it takes to make this stuff work. Matt, when he was talking to start, said that we tried to sort out what matters in terms of habitat type, um, reef site, and, and those kinds of things. And we weren't really able to pin anything down. But we do know that when you look at some places, corals do better than others, and they have historically. Bill alluded to that as well. Um, so, we still have a lot to learn. That, that's an important take home message. Um, some people would say it's a challenge, but it's also an opportunity. And the commitment that CRF has to doing this work is different in a really important way. Academics who go at this typically are running projects. They work on trying to answer a question uh, and the corals are out there one or two years and then the scientists are gone. Um, the commitment that CRF has to plant corals year after year after year is that what gives us a chance, an opportunity to learn about what's happening, but also to have an ecologically relevant amount of coral on the reefs, again, in places where they weren't before. Yes, even beyond that, I think uh, when most of the public thinks, was our work successful or not, the first thing they go to is how much coral is out there. 
But really, we're still early in a learning process. And what the survivorship analysis taught me is two things. One, we actually can get enough coral out that there's something left to study. Yeah, good point. <laughs> That's critical because that means we can now move on, scale up a little bit, and answer the questions that we didn't have the resolution to answer this time. Good point. And we'll probably get to this. I'll jump ahead a little bit, but recognize that staghorn is one of many species that we're working with right now. And so while we're still in the early days of staghorn coral, we're now doing elk corn. We're doing several boulder corals as well. So when Les was talking about assembling a community and putting the pieces together that hopefully will sustain themselves and, and grow, the bigger picture, the bigger story is not just the staghorn coral story, but it's multiple species that we're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think a larger question is, you know, if you if you believe that after, as with the results of this study that restoration actions are a viable technique for saving coral reefs, um, when can we start expecting results? Um, what kind of inputs do we have to put in? How many years, how many resources do we have to put in to get, you know, survivorship and get good results? Um, that's really for everyone across the board. Um, what I would suggest is that, you know, okay. restoration is just one, one aspect of a much bigger picture. It's one, one component. Um, and so that when we're talking about how long it will take for reefs to recover to some semblance of what they were decades ago, it's not just about how many corals we can put out there. It's not just, you know, how long an individual colony survives, but it's what's the community structure around it. What other, you know, social aspects are we doing in terms of trying to reduce climate change impacts or tourism impacts that it's it's all of these different factors that will play together that will ultimately decide that will ultimately influence how long it takes for some of these reefs to recover um, so restoration obviously is one very important part of that but we do have to understand it's just one part of a bigger picture um, you know Amelia there's there's another part of this people may not really appreciate uh, I think they think of us as a bunch of wonks who go out and you know, mess with Carl, and they'll wait to get the answer. It may take a while. This is a community enterprise. We can't uh, really succeed without the whole community buying on. For example, I'm a recreational fisherman. I get really annoyed when people tell me where I can and can't fish. But Carl is essential fish habitat. It's the basis of a lot of the Florida recreation and commercial fishery. Restoring it requires that we have a little breathing space, some areas where there aren't other disturbances going on. And this has been very controversial. So it would help if we had alliance, common cause with the fishing industry, and we would be able to have small areas to expand this work where we're not concerned about anchor damage or fishing gear damage. And in the long run, that, would, that could tremendously help our fishery. Amelia, I would also say when you say, when you ask how long for restoration to be successful, I would ask, well, what are your expectations? Because everyone's baseline is different. When we think about restoration of staghorn coral, are we talking about what we had in the 1970s where we had acres of lush thickets. Um, as we talked about before, that's probably not a realistic expectation now. What we can point towards instead is a population that sustains, its, sustains itself, maintains genetic diversity, resembles the natural population. One of the things that we tried to do with this paper is to help refine definitions of what restoration means. And I think that's something the, the public needs some work on as well. We can help inform about expectations and perhaps the bar is set a little bit lower than most people would expect, but that's pragmatic and still meaningful in an ecological sense for our offshore reefs. I think that's a really good point. I mean, I think that, you know, it's, it's a little unfair for people to expect that every single um, coral that's put out is going to be successful. I think it's, similar to maybe sea turtle hatcheries or something like that, where 
you know, there are thousands and then, you know, the ultimate goal is to have a couple of them survive until adulthood and corals are very similar in that sense. And that's where we come in with our expertise and our ability to really operate at that, you know, really immense scale and be growing tens of thousands of corals on an annual basis and planting those same corals to reefs throughout the Keys. So I sure. absolutely agree. Amelia, also from an economic standpoint, if you ask the question as when can we reap the benefits of coral restoration, uh, I don't know anyone who travels more than about 100 meters on a single scuba dive. And we're approaching the point where we can restore aesthetically uh, enough reef to make it an attractive dive. And if we sink one ship, as an artificial reef to attract fishes for recreational fishing, there's a huge to-do about it. Well, we can restore, we're approaching the point where we can restore on that scale. So I think we're entering a zone now where in the next generation of restoration, there, there can be meaningful economic benefits and that provides a rung on the ladder that we can stand firmly on. Thanks, Liz. Scott, did you get your stuff figured out? I hope so. Can you hear me now? We can. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, awesome. Um, so I know that a couple people have calls at two, so we're running low on time. Um, but a couple last things that I wanted to touch on were just the, the fact that restoration is very, very expensive um, and that it does take a very long time. And I wanted to get... Um, some thoughts on how we justify the, the price tag and how we justify spending all of this money up front just to get to a tipping point so that we can then get um, self-sustaining populations and how we move forward from there. I'll, I'll take a crack at it to, to start. Okay. So if you're running a business, you invest in research and development, you put new products together and usually that percentage of your budget in research and development is not trivial. It could be 10, 20%, maybe more on an annual basis. So what's the value of a reef in Florida or the reef track in general? And economists have taken a look at that and come up with a figure, an asset value of something like $7 billion. Half the jobs in Florida are tourist related, uh, in, the, in the Keys anyways, I'm not sure Florida wide. There's a project that's just starting out right now called Iconic Reefs. And they propose to spend $100 million to restore seven reefs throughout the Florida reef tracks. Well, $100 million is about a percent and half, a percentage, 1.5% of 7 billion to asset value. So if you look at relative costs, um, putting investments relative to what the payback is going to be. Um, I would argue that maybe the costs aren't as big as most people think. Um, marine biologists have an inferiority complex about spending money and how much things cost. Um, projects in physics cost billions of dollars to learn something about how our world is put together with no immediate payoffs, though there certainly have, have been in the, in the past. I, I would say that the costs are not as high as people think they are because the paybacks are going to come in tourist dollars, um, the asset value of the reef itself. Um, these are investments that, that make a lot of good sense. And frankly, when we first started out, um, uh, compared to where we were, the costs are decreasing. And anytime you scale something up, the costs per unit go way down. And we're kind of in that transition phase right now where we can expect that the per coral cost or the per reef cost is gonna go down as we get better and better at growing corals in the nursery and being efficient and innovative about getting into the offshore reefs. And Stephen, your point about the $7 billion, that's per annum. And that's not yeah. you know, amortized over any period of time. So when you're talking about investment, you're not talking about a single investment on one year, but th the value of the reefs on a per annum basis are $7 billion. So when you start adding that up and you look at not just tourism, but commercial fisheries, 
and the like, I mean, it's, it's, it's a huge payout for a small investment. So Amelia, it's not really extensive. It's not. <laughs> Your question was wrong. <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, how do you actually put a value on it? I mean, for the Seven Icons project, as an example, that is a fraction of one planned trip to Mars, right? How do we put a value on an entire ecosystem that we're you know, looking at? Um, these kind of economic models, I think, become very dangerous. Uh, in the absence of looking at things from a total perspective. I like that we're going after the space exploration industry at the moment. <laughs> uh, I don't yeah, know. I'm, I'm a billion dollars to find water. We found water and there's <laughs> life in it. Let's, let's spend a tiny part on trying to understand it. I'm sure those at the Aquarius base would appreciate having a nice week. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I think you need to be careful when you start making comparisons with other things that society values. Um, it's, it's hard to uh, justify your cost by trying to take somebody else's down. Well, yeah, so I'm, and that's not the point I was trying to make. The point I was trying to make is that there are lots of complex issues. This is not an astronomical cost when you take exactly. out the types of big science we're trying to understand. I think that was well put. So I'm not asking to take money away from NASA. <laughs> Let's be clear. All right, so I, I know we're, we're almost done, um, but I just kind of as a wrap up wanted to get, um, wanted to hear how, how as restoration projects grow in scale and in number of species and in number of countries that they're active in, um, how do we continue to make sure that we're looking for evidence of long-term success? What, um, what kind of metrics are we using or what kind of benchmarks do we need to look for to make sure that we're seeing success across the board? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, one thing that this paper does, I think, is it's set some benchmarks in the sense that we're looking now at populations and how do populations perform. And that includes metrics like abundance, survivorship, um, condition, uh, rather than just putting a few corals out like we used to and, and, and monitor a small percentage of the population to see whether or not the stuff even works. We, we're way beyond that and now at the point where um, we should be doing ecology and the populations of all planted corals. I would believe that this paper really points to the need for that sustained monitoring effort. It's not that you know you go out once a year for two years kind of a thing that this needs to be built into the, the out planning design to have a long-term sustained monitoring effort we are not just looking at you know the corals themselves. How big is it from time A to time B? Has it survived from A to B? But also looking at you know the reef, the reef communities themselves around it. What's the fish density like? What's the algae doing? What are the water temperatures doing? That there are so many other things that play into whether or not this population grows or shrinks. Um, that we need to get out from just monitoring the coral itself to looking at that bigger picture of how the reef is functioning and making sure that that sustained effort is really there for for the foreseeable future. Yeah, it isn't just putting uh, staghorn or elkhorn or boulder coral out. It's wondering at what point it really becomes a coral reef again and starts to sustain itself. And I think that's what everyone is hoping for. Uh, it's not just fixing individual sites, but at some point we return to a Florida coral reef that can rescue parts that are in distress coming from parts that are doing a little bit better. We're, we're trying to re-knit the whole system back together again. And in the wake of this study, I'm much more hopeful that that's achievable. All right, any final thoughts? Amelia, thank you for giving us the opportunity to talk more about this paper and the implications. Yeah, thank you all for making the time and really digging into this with us, um, you know, not just scratching the surface, really asking the hard hitting questions and getting there. Thank you guys for making this happen. <laughs>